Okay. All right. So to everybody who's listening today, my guest is Peter Mount Shasta. Peter is the founder of the Church of the Seven Race, and he found this at the request of Descendant Master Saint Germain, and for the purpose of helping people find their own God presence within themselves. Peter is also the author of several books, and he is going to share his spiritual journey with us today on this podcast. Peter, thank you. I am so, so grateful because this is really an honor for me to be able to share this space with you. Thank you so much. It's my joining. pleasure, Nandita. Thank you for making this possible. Uh, well, so, Peter, can I start with my first question? Because that can, you know, like help uh, everyone listening to understand true. where you started. So, you know, you speak about being influenced by Ram Das's book, Be Here Now, which was like, uh, I think, quite an influencer for many people. I mean, not just now, but at that time, especially. Mm -hmm. And you came to India to meet Neem Karoli Baba. Yeah. Yes. But was it the only trigger or was there something stemming before that already? Because those could be like the main propeller. Could you take us through what was actually Yeah, well, going I should on? tell you a little about my childhood. You know, I grew up in a very wealthy community near New York City. And my neighbors like owned multinational corporations or they worked for the president. But I saw these people were not happy, you know. It didn't matter how much money they had, you know, they had a lot of stress and they were alcoholics or they were not happy people, you know. So I said, there has to be something more to life. And I, I prayed to God, but I didn't get any answer. So I was really an atheist. But when I, I moved to New York City after college and just to work on my health, I started doing Hatha Yoga, you know, uh, with Swami Satchidananda, okay. you know. And uh, he was a very beautiful guy, you know, but still I didn't really believe in God. Then when I started the fir very first time I started to do Hatha Yoga, I felt energy in my body. And I said, oh, there is something beyond the physical plane, you know, because I can feel this energy. And I got very excited and I left the first yoga class and I went to metaphysical bookstore and I said, what is your best book on yoga that you have? And it was a book about, it was the one actually about Swami Vivekananda, I think by, I think it's by M, something like this. Sri M. Yeah. Yeah. And when I read that, it was like a light went on. It just like, I, I knew the truth of it, you know, and I got very excited. And then I, that made me want to do the Hatha Yoga even more, you know. And one day I was doing Hatha Yoga, and at the end of it, I was doing Savasana, you know, with the corpse pose. And it's funny, Swami Satyadananda, he said, he said to me personally, he said, I know everybody's favorite pose here, it's the Savasana. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but anyway, I was doing Savasana, I went into Samadhi, where there was no self, just bliss, and the sound of Om, you know, the pr pranava. Mm. Mm -hmm. And when I came back from that, then I really knew the truth that what Swami Satchidin, uh, what 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 Vivekananda was talking about, Ramakrishna, I experienced it that you can, that is something real, you know. But of course, then I, you know, meditation and hatha yoga, that that was like a gift. It didn't do it every time. You know what I mean? So I said, I want to find out how to achieve that naturally. And uh, that's when I heard Ram Das interviewed on the radio. <clears throat> and I saw a ball of light come from, the, come from India, hit me in the third eye. And that's when I felt Maharaji inviting me to come visit him, you know. So that was your gateway, essentially, already like the call coming in. Gateway, yeah. And, you know, a lot of other things happened, but when I got to India, I, <clears throat> I saw people that were happy, even they had nothing. The guy selling peanuts, you know, he seemed to be happy sitting on his little cloth. He was talking to his friends. When his friends weren't there, he was, had his japa mala, he was doing japa, or the rickshaw driver was chanting, you know, some... Uh, Kirtan or and I saw people. 
I saw light coming out of people, very simple, you know, people had simple lives, you know, and I said, this is what I've been looking for. And uh, so then I started traveling around India to meet some of these, well, of course, I met uh, Maharaji Neem Karoli Baba, you know, but he, it's funny, he did not want to be my guru. He would see, he was trying to tell me the guru is inside, mm. you know, yeah. because he didn't give any teachings, you know, he said, love people and feed them. You know, but I kept waiting for more, you know, and he didn't give more. And I met some very, very great yogis that could, uh, one yogi, he, he knew I was craving spinach, you know, but spinach like I got in my garden, you know, just steamed lightly with, with ghee on it and chapatis, you know. He didn't have a fire even, he just was wearing a dhoti. This was up on the Ganges near Rishikesh. He waved his hand and a bowl of steamed spinach appeared in his hand and he gave it to me to eat, you know? And two, two toasted chapatis with ghee on them. You know, it was exactly what I'd been craving. He knew I was craving that and he made it out of thin air. But you was... never felt daunted, like sometimes like, oh, you know, where have I come? Like, you know, because in the 70s, India was a completely different space. And, you know, the, the world was larger, not like now when it's slightly, you know, more smaller in many ways. You never you know felt what? like I was. Yeah, before I even saw Maharaji, I was living near Hardwar in an ashram with a lot of Western people there. And one day I just started walking along the game. See, I had read Siddhartha by Herman Hesse. Mm, okay. you know, so many Americans, they read that, then they want to go to <laughs> India, become enlightened, you know? So here I was, I had no possessions with me and I was wearing my white kurta and my, you know, like pajama pants, you know? And I was walking along the Ganges like Siddhartha. <laughs> listening to the river. And I said, see, in those days in India, a sadhu could just show up. You would be supported. You didn't need money. Mm. You could stay overnight in a temple for three days and you would be fed and you could just be completely immersed in the search for God and you would be supported. And I, I said, here I am. Now I'm walking along the Ganges like Siddhartha and I'm going to meet my guru, and I'm going to become enlightened, and I never need to worry about any other material thing, <laughs> just be in bliss for the rest of my life. So I'm walking along the bank of the Ganges, you know, there's nobody around. Then I see a sadhu coming toward me, and he looks at me, and he's walking up to me, and I think, ah, at last, my guru, do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so he said... He said, come. And I said, oh, great. He said, sit down. So we sat down on the bank of the river. And I said, oh, great. He's going to give me my mantra and I'm going to be enlightened, you know. He pulled up his sleeves like this. He had wristwatches and bracelets all up his arm. He said, do you like to buy something for your mother, your girlfriend, a souvenir? You know, he, he was just a phony. He was not a sadhu. He was dressed like that. He knew Americans were around there, yeah. you know, and he was just trying to make money. And I thought, oh, no, this was a big disappointment to me, you know. So I realized then I had to be a little more discriminating. Right. So but then eventually I saw, you know, um, Maharaji, Ramdas, and so on. And I wandered around India. I, one of the high points was meeting Ananda May Ma. And when did you meet her? Well, the first time I met her, I was living in Varanasi on a houseboat, right, right near the burning ghats, like where they're burning the bodies. In fact, I went, I went to swim in the Ganges. I had to wait for body parts to float by. There was a skull, mm -hmm. you know, but I swam in the Ganges. And it felt like swimming in champagne. I, my whole body was electrified from it. And, you know, they were chanting the Maha Mantra all the time, 24 hours a day, you know. But on New Year's Eve, I heard that at um, some of the other Americans who were there, who were uh, disciples of Maharaji, they said, let's go see Ananda May Mai. She has an ashram there in Varnasi. So 
we went there and uh, I took her some sweets, you know, but she looked very bored, you know, she did not enjoy, you know, after a while, you know, after 30 years of people trying to touch your feet wherever yeah. you go, it gets a little bit old after a while, you know. Yeah. And so I went up and she just, you know, I, you know, I give you my blessings and then she, you can go and this, it was very disappointing. So I made a prayer that I would meet her sometime alone in the country. Okay. You know, I said, either her or some great saint. I want to talk to one of these people just one-on-one, -on -one, you know? So about a month later, I was staying in Jagannath Puri that some other Westerners and I rented a house right on the beach. And uh, it was very, very beautiful place, you know? And um, one day I walked into town to buy some rice and the woman in front of me turned around. There was a woman in front of me all dressed in white and she was buying some rice also. And she turned around and it was Ananda May Ma. And I went, oh my gosh, it's the answer to a prayer, you know? So I quickly, I ran, there was a sweet shop next door. I bought some miso or pak, you know? And I gave it to her, and this time she accepted it. She said, oh, she said, ha, thank you. You know, she took mm -hmm. it and put it in her bag, you know. So I, I, I didn't want to be impolite, you know, so I was walking behind her. Then I thought, we're both walking up the road together, and she's carrying a very heavy bag of groceries. So I offered, may I carry your, your bag for you? She said, no, thank you. But then she started talking. The funny thing is she was talking in Bengali, I think, mm -hmm. and I was talking in English. We both understood each other perfectly. So that's like a miracle there. So we had a nice conversation. I told her why I was in India and she just said, uh, cha, cha, you know, so on. Then she came to her ashram and she turned off the road, you know. So then the next day, the next day, I, I see every day I went to visit the Jagannath temple. I was hoping I could get in, but they didn't allow. Yeah, they wouldn't let you get in. They would in. not allow Westerners yeah. to go in, you know. So I was coming back from the temple in the rickshaw, and she was by the side of the road. She had three or four of her devotees with her. She saw me before I saw her, and she bowed like this, you know, and it, I, I stood up, I felt her energy, I stood up, I almost fell out of the rickshaw. Because she trans, trans, transmuted or she transmitted to me God consciousness, you know, like, I knew she was seeing God, you know, they say mm -hmm. namaste, the God in me honors the God in you, but she yeah. was, she was seeing God, you know what I mean? Yes. And it was so powerful, I went back to the place where I was staying, I went up on the roof. There was a flat roof. And for three days, I meditated. I said, I want to see in myself what she is seeing. And that was a real turning point in my life. I said, this is very real. God is in me, you know, and God is in everybody. And I want to experience that more, you know. And it wasn't until I came back, I came to Mount Jasta, in 1973 that I met Pearl and she taught me how to do that consciously and it's interesting because these what's called the I am teachings are really from India all the great spiritual teachings come from the rishis but they've taken on a new form in the west they call it you know I am teachings well that's like aham brahma smi I am brahman yeah. you know yeah. Of course, it's not the ego that's Brahman, you know, it's the jyoti, the light in here, right. is Brahman. So Brahman mm -hmm. lives in each of us. So, or you can say soham or just aham, you know, you're, you're acknowledging I am, you know. And so what my teacher Pearl was teaching was these, it's called the I am teachings that whatever you say after I am is what you create, you know. If you say, I am love, you become love. 
But do you think sometimes like, you know, uh, the I am-ness, like, you know, some teachers often say I am-ness is the first uh, barrier really. And there is just more behind it. Is that how it goes? Like exactly. I am-ness is that's, Yeah. Is that's it the subject of my new book. It's called I am the key to mastery. So a lot of people see the Tibetans especially say you have to kill the sense of I am, you know? Mm. What they mean is the ego. You know, it's the ego that says, you know, I want to, you know, I want to have curry for dinner, or I want, uh, I want to meet my soulmate, or I want more money, or whatever. That's the ego. So you have to stop identifying with the ego. So to kill the human eye, you know, but beyond the human is the, the Atman. It goes from lifetime to lifetime. The Atman does not die. The ego dies, you know but the Atman does not die. So when you say I am, you want to say it from the, the Atman and the Atman is anchored in your heart. You know, that's what the Jyoti is. There's actually a light there, a little spark of light, a flame. Is there ever like, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't want to use the word danger because that sounds too big a word, but like, you know, when the ego, because we start off uh, with the ego saying I am, right? And then we try to move yeah. backwards inside. But when I'm saying I am, is there ever like a space where like the ego can think, oh, I am God and it comes from an egoic space and it just kind of gets stuck there? Is it possible for that? No, happen? that, that happens. That happens to the people. In fact, some people even... In the West, it's called, uh, what do they call it? The, oh, there was a, a film called The Secret, you know? It's called The, the Law of Manifestation. Yeah, you know? yeah, I read the book, yes. Yeah, How to yeah. Manifest What You Want. Yeah. And that yeah. does help people. Like, if you say, I want a new car, then, oh, there's the car, and it's just what I was thinking about, and so mm -hmm. on. You know, but then after a while, you think, what do I do with all this stuff that I created, you know? You know, right. so there was a turning point in my life where I saw using I am, I could create what I wanted, but then it wasn't what God wanted, you know, it's just what the ego wanted. So I sat down in a cafe and I said, I'm not going to leave this table until God shows me what God wants, you know. So I said, Thy will, not my will, be done. That I want, I only want to do what God wants me to do, what my Atman wants. And so I knew, you know, God was probably not going to walk in in a physical body and say, Peter, do this or do that. So I knew it would come from within me, an inner guidance. So this is kind of what Pearl taught me, how to feel the guidance of God within your heart. You know, it's not a voice or something like that. I mean, it could come as a voice, but frequently it's just a feeling, you know. In fact, the highest form of guidance is just spontaneously do the right thing, you know, and you know that it's right because it feels right, you know. So, you know, I was sitting in this cafe. I sat there for about two hours. Then I heard some people came in. They started talking about something happening in Oregon, which is about an hour drive. And right away, I felt this energy. I have to go there, you know. So I got in my car. I drove there. And I met some people that offered me a place to stay. It was like being a sadhu, you know. For two weeks, I was gone just being a sadhu in America. I didn't change my clothes, put on, you know, a different robe or anything. I just, I'm going to follow every second the, the, the guidance of God in my heart. I had no plans in my head at all. So I drove north. Every day I had some adventure, like I'd be driving on the freeway. And I would feel, get off at the next exit. And then I would hear, stop, stop the car. Do you see that man over there? Talk to him. So I talked to that man and he said, oh, I was just praying for guidance. He said, I'm, you know, I'm feeling suicidal. I don't know what to do. And so I would talk with him. Then I would get back on the freeway. Then something else would happen. So for two weeks, I just trusted in the moment that I would be guided and everything opened up. People offered me places to stay. People bought me meals. And then I got to Canada and something, so then I turn around, go back. It, it was miraculous. So that was like a two week crash course in following guidance. So would you like, say like following guidance would be like um, to somewhere not plan? Yeah. 
Like say, okay, every morning I would drive to the post office. You know, from where I am now, it's 20 minute drive, but where I used to live, say 10 minute drive, every, I had a little, you know, routine. So I feel, okay, I'm driving to the post office, but on the way I would get this feeling, turn left here. That's strange, why would I do that? But the feeling was very strong. So, and then I heard park, park, there's a parking space, park there. I said, why am I doing that? I don't know why. Then I get out of the car, somebody comes up to me, says, oh, you're Peter. I've been, I didn't know how to get hold of you. I need to talk with you, you know? That I just came to Mount Shasta, I'm on a spiritual pilgrimage and I wanted to talk with you, but I didn't have your phone number. So then I would, you know, spend an hour talking with that person, help them. You know, then I could go to the post office. And that happens every day. But, you know, for most of us, the egoic mind is so strong. We don't even know how to distinguish between that, you know, that little voice, which is like the Atman or like that. Uh, how, how do we do that? Well, that's, you know, when you, in meditation, if you meditate on the jyoti in your center of your being, you know, it's, it's not the physical heart, it's under the sternum. You know, and they say a little bit to the right of the sternum, you can tap on it. Like if I say, who are you? You don't point to your head or your shoulder, you point to the center of your chest. That's, this, that's where I, the I that I am, is anchored in your body. That's where the God flame is anchored, you know? And if that God flame left, you would die. You could not, your heart would not beat. You would not breathe without that flame. That flame is every second saying to the heart, beat, 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 mm -hmm. you know? So you meditate on that, on that light. It's, it's more of a feeling, you know? But you can imagine it like a sun, like it's a light there. And that strengthens your connection with, with it. And that's where you get the guidance from that feeling, you know? So the more you meditate, the stronger that connection gets, you know? So then you can distinguish between your thoughts and the actual feeling, you know, coming from your heart, you know? Mm. And there, there are other ways to do it. That was the light, you know, meditate on the sun in the center of your chest. You could also use a mala and do japa, do a mantra, you know? Uh, you know, even, you know, Sri Ram, Sri Ram, Sri Ram, you know, there, there are many thousands of mantras just to still the mind so you can get the feeling. But ultimately, you have to come to the center of your being, which is, you know, in the center of your chest, that feeling. And then you go beyond the ego, beyond the little eye to the big eye. And, you know, it's there all the time. It doesn't matter what name. You know, it's funny, when I first went to India, I thought, oh, these Indians, they have so many thousands of gods, and they're all in statues, they're worship. that was the thing, they're worshipping stone idols, do you know what I mean? Yeah. See, I grew up, my background was Jewish, you know, and they say, you shall not worship false idols, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, like a statue of, of a man with a head of an elephant, to me, that would be... <laughs> A false god, you know what I mean? Well, one day I was at Puta Party, you know, Sai Baba's ashram, and they had just built a big statue of Ganesh, you know, 10 feet tall. And I heard they were going to dedicate it. They had the Vedic pundits there chanting, you know, and Sai Baba was there. And I was standing there thinking, oh boy, these Indians will worship anything. They're, you know, worship this stone, you know, being half elephant, half human. You well, all of a sudden, I saw this light come down and go into the statue. That these these pundits chanting in Sanskrit, plus with Sai Baba there, they were invoking God to come into the statue. You know, so then the people go to that statue and pray. Then it's not just they're not they're not praying to a stone image; they are praying to a God being. Mm -hmm. So someone hears their prayers. That that really opened my eyes to something, you know? And then I saw, you know, a few days later, I saw some Indian people take a coconut, you know, just uh, not the green coconut, the inside, the, the shell that was brown, you know, the dried the coconut. The brown one, the dried coconut, yeah. yeah. And they took it and they smashed it on the, at the feet of Ganesh. 
So I went up to them when they were finished. I said, excuse me, you know, you just wasted a coconut. There's people starving. <laughs> Why don't you give the coconut? You know, this is a waste. But he, they said, no, that was my ego. I offered my ego to God. And I said, oh, oh, okay, I get it. So I went, I bought a coconut. I did the same thing. That was also felt absolutely wonderful to do that. You know, I said, God, this is my human ego. I offer it to you and I smashed it on the stone. And I said, I walked away. I have now surrendered my ego to God. Of course, it's not that simple, but that was, it's very important, I think, to do, you know, some of these rituals have tremendous power in them if you do them consciously. The symbolism is helpful too. Yeah, you know, I think for some women to become pregnant is a surrender of the ego, you know, because suddenly, you know, men have to do this ritual, but for a woman to suddenly another being is in your body, and then even pregnancy is just the beginning. When the baby is born, you talk about surrender of the ego. You can't say, I want to do this, I want to do that. The baby tells you what to do. That's a big, big ego surrender, you know, and men should honor that that's a valid spiritual path. See, a lot of the sadhus that I met in the Himalayas, they they may have been very enlightened, but they were not balanced. They did not have a good view of women. They regarded, you know, women as lower. But I, when I see what women goes through raising children, uh, that's tremendous surrender of the ego and, um, you know, manifestation of the goddess, the divine mother aspect, you know, and that men need to also incorporate the divine mother aspect, mm -hmm. you know. I, I'm sure some of these uh, yogis that were enlightened in the Himalayas had to come back as women and be mothers and raise children and learn to get along with people in the world. You know, I, I met a yogi in, um, in Nanital, you know, and it, it, when I was visiting Maharaji, and he would have been meditating up near Badranath on the glaciers, you know, and um, I invited him to have chai with me in a cafe. So we went in, and he looked around. And he said, "Ah, there's women in here," you know, mm -hmm. like he couldn't handle it, you know. But then I said, "Look, calm down. They're they're not going to, you know, it's okay." Yeah. You know. Then I asked him. Would you like to have a ladu, you know, the sweet, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and he said, Oh, can I have a ladu? Yes. I then he said, Can I have another one? <laughs> yes. Then I think he said, Can I have another one? And he was going crazy with desire for ladus, you know? Mm. Then he said, I have to get out of here. There's women in sweeps in here. I, I have to go back on the glacier and meditate and get my purity, get my purity back, you know. So, you know, he the next step, and that's not mastery, you know, he maybe right. experienced oneness, like he could go into samadhi, but he didn't know how to be in the world. So mm -hmm. what a master is, this is what a teaching that I find in the West, using the I am teachings, enlightenment is the first step, you know, the next step is to be a master in the world. So like, so nobody knows you're enlightened, you don't go around saying I'm a guru, you know, where are my disciples, you know, uh, you can be a businessman, you can be a householder, and be a normal person in the world that nobody needs to know, you also experience samadhi and, and, and God intoxication, you know, Ramakrishna couldn't drive a car or, you know, cook a meal or something, you know, because he wasn't even aware where he was some of the time, you know. Yeah. Uh, did you always, uh, you know, I mean, uh, Peter, you know, the thing is, I, I truly believe you've had some great sadhana in some previous life because the experiences you speak about, it comes through some sadhana sometime, you know, which you may have right. gone through. Uh, so some part of you was already, already ready, you know, because it's not ordinary, like, you know, we see idols of Ganesha every day, we see invocations of it, but not many of us will see a light as like the God being entered it, you know, when the entire ritual is being performed. So it was, so you already were somewhere prepared. Did you always know about the white brotherhood? Like, because oh no, no. they are not, you know, I mean, I read about them a little bit and uh, I was very intrigued. 
uh, because it was a comforting fact also. Imagine you know, knowing these ascended masters around you and they make it seem so like, you know, we are there and they're accessible. But at some point, you know, they also felt like, you know, there's not much information about them. So how did you like, you know, know about them and why St. Germain? Was it some connection? Ah, had that's beautiful. Yeah. Okay. So when I came back from India, you know, I, at least now I, I believed in God, you know, I mean, I experienced God and I saw that there, there were enlightened beings who could work, you know, magic, you know, they could, you know, do kinds of amazing things, you know, but I didn't, I didn't really think that there was some enlightened being who lived on another dimension, you know, who was aware of me, you know, like I still never experienced that if I pray to one of these beings, I would get an answer, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, you think of, because a lot of the, it seemed like a lot of the Hindu teachings, when you become enlightened, you disappear. You know, like Ramakrishna said, it's like you take, you go down to the ocean with salt and you put the salt in the ocean and it disappears. So I thought if you become enlightened, you just merge with Brahman, you know, mm -hmm. and that's the end, no more self. So I thought if somebody is really enlightened, then there's nobody to pray to, do you know what I mean? If they're really enlightened, you know, so... You know, I lived with a yogi for a while in the Himalayas who was getting ready to leave his body, you know, like consciously die, you know what I mean, right. and go to a higher plane. So I started thinking, I was in Berkeley near San Francisco, and I thought that sounds like a good idea because I no longer crave the things that the West, that America is known for, you know, fast cars and parties and alcohol and you know, having a big house that didn't, I knew that was not going to make me happy. So I thought, you know, I think I will leave my body like the yogi in the Himalayas, you know. And did you and know so how I to went, do that? What? Did you What's know that? how to do that? Because there's a process to, I believe, leaving the body as well. Oh, yeah, it's a process and it's not all that easy, but I was, I, I was going to try anyway, okay. you know. <laughs> And uh, the first step would be to pray to do it. So I went out to this forest, this redwood forest called Muir Woods. It's it, it's in Marin County, across the across the bay from San Francisco, where these huge trees. And uh, it was raining. There was nobody else there in the parking lot. And I walked into this forest, and I found a tree that was hollow from fire. And I got inside the trunk of the tree to get out of the rain. And I started doing Vipassana meditation with my eyes open, looking at the ground, but watching the in-breath and the out-breath, you know, just feeling my breathing to still my mind. And then I said, I will, leaving my body is a big, that's a big decision. I will pray for permission to do this. And I still didn't really believe anybody would hear me if I prayed, but I, I prayed to, you know, to Krishna and to Buddha and to Jesus and Mother Mary. And then I, I had heard, I had been a guest of the Theosophical Society, so I prayed also to St. Germain and, you know, to Babaji and everybody I could think of, you know, I, maybe 20 different beings I prayed to. I, I said, I, I asked for permission to leave my body. All of a sudden, a man materialized out of the air in front of me, you know, wearing blue jeans, you know, a young man like me. I was in my, I was maybe 27 years old at this point. Physical body, and this is not a etheric body, and I, I had not taken any drugs or anything. And he said, Peter, your prayer has been heard. I am the part of the Godhead that has been sent to answer your prayer. And I said, that's amazing. This is the first time in my life a prayer has ever been answered, you know. And he said, you have finished enough of your karma that you can leave your body if you want. And I am here to help you. I will help you leave your body. And um, he touched my third eye, the Ajna Chakra. And I suddenly I was outside my physical body. I looked back. There was my physical body sitting in the tree in, you know, lotus position, you know. 
And he put his arm around my shoulder and he took me up off the earth to this higher world, you know. And the beings there were the Atman, you know. I was in my Atmat body, you know. They, every being was a ball of light giving off rainbow colors. And they were all in like, it was like Samadhi. The, the bliss was just overwhelming, feeling of, of love and bliss. And I said, this is great. This is where I want to be, you know. And I thought, you know, this is, I prayed and he answered my prayer. And now, you know, this is where I'm going to be now in a state of bliss all the time. But then I heard just crying coming from someplace and the crying got louder and louder. And I looked down and I saw the earth below me. It was just a small blue ball. And my heart went out and I just said, oh, I want to go back and help people. He said, this is what the masters hear all the time. That is the suffering of humanity. And we hear this all the time. And I said, I can't turn my back on that. I want to go back and help people. And you see, that was the choice to be a bodhisattva, you know. He didn't call it that. He didn't put a fancy name on it. But he said, you made the right choice. Now we'll be, we will be working close together. And, uh, but you need training first. Before you can help me, you need to get training. And he said, I want you to go to Mount Shasta. And your teacher is waiting there. And the first person you meet in town will tell you what to do next. And then we were suddenly, I was back in my physical body, and he was standing in front of me, still wearing jeans, you know, blue jeans. And he said, now I will show you who I am. And he took a few steps back, and he turned gradually into this master wearing a white robe. And it was this being, Saint Germain. And I had seen his picture in the front of the book Unveiled Mysteries when I was at the Theosophical Society. You know, so I, I recognized that's who it was. And then he just disappeared. This is like Obi-Wan Kenobi in Star Wars. You know, he just completely disappeared. So I got in my car. I felt so electrified, you know. And I, I drove to Mount Shasta. Now, normally, this would be a six-hour drive. I got there in two hours. So somehow, I was like, I went beyond time and space, you know because I must have left there at nine o'clock and people were having breakfast in Mount Shasta. That was like 11 o'clock I got there. So a young guy came up, I mean, about my own age. He owned the health food store there. He said, you're supposed to see Pearl. And he said, you can come to my store and use the telephone. And I thought, I don't know who Pearl is, but I was told to do what the first person I met told me to do. So I went to his store and I called Pearl and she said, come right up. Well, I got to her house and she lived in an ordinary house. She didn't live in a temple or an ashram, you know. And uh, see, the Divine Mother can exist in any form. She doesn't need to wear a, a white robe or have followers, you know. So she said, I've been, a, she looked like, you know, your grandmother, you know, like a sweet old lady. And she said, oh, I've been expecting you. And I said, how could you be expecting me? We've never met before. And she said, the Master Saint Germain came to me this morning and said he was sending you to see me. And then I went into her living room. There was a picture of Saint Germain. I said, that's the man who sent me. She says, yes, I know. He told me all about you and so on. And she said, he's teaching you. And I said, I don't hear anything. Would you channel a message? She said, I don't channel, that would weaken you. You have to learn to get it inside. You'll probably get it as a feeling, not as words, you know? Mm -hmm. So you need, so she said, meditate on Saint Germain. So I, she said, just say, I am the presence of Saint Germain. And I said, but I'm not Saint Germain, I'm Peter. And she said, you're not claiming to be him. Just, just, it's like an, an affirmation, like medit when you say, Ram, 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 you're invoking Ram within you, you know. So by saying, I am the presence of Saint Germain, I was invoking him. Then I started to feel like he was laughing. And I heard him say, I'm so, I'm happy you finally found me, you know. So this is actually, you see, making contact with the guru, the guru's within. 
And everybody has a guru, except most of the time, the guru lets you do your own thing, you know, until you say, thy will, not my will be done. You know, most of the time you're allowed to follow your ego. Do you know what I mean? Until you get to that point where you say, I'm tired of following my ego. I really want to contact the guru. And it doesn't matter what name you call God by, do you know? There's something Ananda May Mai said, God by any name will respond to you. God is very smart and has very good ears, very good hearing, you know. So if you say, you know, if you say Ma or Devi or Krishna or whoever it is, your higher self will hear you. There's a beautiful little, you know, like a sentence, you know, in your book, like where uh, I think it's a discourse by Saint Germain only. And he says, I have better hearing than you can imagine. Yeah. And, and like some of you might like to think of. And I loved it. I was smiling and it makes it sound so accessible. Like, you know, that you can meet these ascended masters or in, in their subtle form. They're all around. Is it really that simple for all of us, Peter? Yes, absolutely. To think like, you know, because we don't even know how to pray sincerely. It's always our ego. How do we go out but to there's them? a sincere, even the ego has, well, it's not, you know, that's the thing is to meditate on, you can observe the ego. Who is it that's observing the ego? That's something else. You know, what is that? In fact, I was thinking of the, that as the title for my next book, you know, what are you? you know, or what is that? Do you know what I mean? So... You know, you're aware of the ego, but who is that that's aware of the ego? That is the beginning of your higher self, you know, or the impersonal self. So that's that's the next step in Vipassana. The first step is is the shamatha, stilling, stilling the mind by observing the breath. The next step, once the mind calms down a bit, and you can observe the thoughts going by, you know, and the thoughts go slower and slower, and after a while, you observe there's a space between the thoughts, you know, but then you ask, you say, there is something observing my mind, is something observing my ego, what is that? I want to be one with that, you know, and that's the great story that Eckhart Tolle tells, you know, he was yeah. a very depressed guy. And then one night, he realized that there was somebody observing the Eckhart that was depressed, you know, and the self that was observing was not depressed, you know, and he said, wow, I could identify with the Eckhart that's not depressed, you know, and he made a switch like that. And he woke up in the morning, he was still in that consciousness, you know. He literally woke up enlightened. <laughs> yeah. So it's basically all about when you're able to still your mind, the masters are always there to speak to us. Yeah, but even, even if, you know, you, even if you don't meditate, if you're in a dire situation, you call on God, it doesn't matter what name you call God help me, you will get some assistance, you know. Right. That is you know, I heard someone say you know they were i forgot what the situation they called out god help me and they heard this voice that said i am you know i am helping you you know there is you know it's not a thing that caught my attention in your book you know because all the discourses by the masters you know somewhere um they have a common thread and one of it is like you know they're referring to how we need to like you know what you said watching our thoughts and not letting negative thought patterns come in because thought patterns also have a form like if we could see them we can see mm -hmm. thought patterns form itself and you know the kind like so obviously when you're thinking negative things it creates the world around us so can you explain that to us like you know uh, how exactly uh, what are these impressions do thoughts really belong to well, us? Well, the easiest way, the easiest example is uh, watching the news on TV or, you know, you watch the daily news. It can be very depressing. And they, they try to convince you, you know, that things are very bad or things are getting worse or something, you know. And, you know, if you start every day looking at the news like that, you uh, 
then there are lots of negative affirmations that come into your mind, you know, that influence you. And then you talk to other people and they agree, they've seen the same news and everybody agrees how bad it is. But what if you stopped? I mean, I still look at the news headlines, you know, because I feel that's a part of mastery. Where in the world do they need help? You know, so when I look at the news, I can see, oh, there are children starving in Syria. I can send light to them. Or I need to send light to the Ukraine, you know, or whatever. That shows me where there's work needed. But see, I turn it around. There's a negative situation. And then I turn it around to make it something positive, you know that there's where I can send love and send light to those people, you know. So it's very easy, you know, like if you, if, it's funny, you know, like say you look at your checkbook and you think, well, there's not so much money in there. I, I, a little, how am I going to pay my bills? And then you start to worry and then you wake up the next morning and you think, oh boy, then you start to get depressed about money, you know, but you can turn that around and say, look, I dedicate my life to God. God is going to make sure I have the money I need, you know? So then you can affirm, I am abundant. I am the presence doing the perfect work and God is seeing to it, I have the money I need. Like maybe some, some wealthy donor will hear your podcast and think, oh, this woman is doing good work. I would like to donate money to support her so she can do this full time, you know? But you have to accept that. You say, I am being supported doing the work God wants me to do, you know, instead of thinking, oh, I only got so much, only have a thousand rupees in my bank account, you know, so on, to turn it around. I am abundant and I am doing God's work and I am being supported in doing that, you know. You know, there's there's this, uh, you, you may know the rock star, he's not alive now, James Brown, you know mm -hmm. him? So one morning I woke up and I was uh, feeling a little depressed. I was thinking, you know, I, I was low on money and I, you know, had some health issues and uh, had a problem with some, a friend and, you know, a lot of negative thoughts going through my mind. So I was lying there in bed. Suddenly in my mind, I heard this song by James Brown. I feel good. I knew that I would. You know what I mean? So I jumped out of bed. I felt fantastic. That was the affirmation. I feel good. If you say that to yourself every morning, I feel good and I am good and I am doing good things throughout the day. I am blessing people. I am the presence of God in action throughout this day. Immediately you've erased the negative things. And if, as soon as a negative thought comes in, you turn it around, you know. Now you could say it, you don't have to say it in English, it could be said in Sanskrit. That's a lot of these mantras are, you know, in Sanskrit, if you can, you know, you can say them in English or Sanskrit or Hindi, whatever has the most energy for you. Right. You know, like uh, some of these mantras are incredibly powerful. Like I try to start the day, if, if the sun is shining, I go outside, I say the Gayatri mantra. And I look at the sun and I just, I look at the sun for a second, then I close my eyes, I bring the sunlight into my heart. And, you know, Om Bhur Bhuvasubha Tatsavitu Varenyam Vargo Devasya Dimehi Diyo Yonak Prachodeyat. And I see the sun, my body is like made of crystal and the sunlight is shining out through me into the world. I've done something good for humanity, just doing that. It, it, there's no limit. It goes out through the entire earth, one person doing that. What if you get 100,000 people doing that every morning? I mean, you know, that's doing something about, do something about doing something. <laughs> you know, that's a positive, that's a way to generate positive, energy every morning before you go to work or whatever, you know. You don't Again, have to be abundant to do that, you know. 
You know, in your book again, again, I think the Saint Germain's like, you know, quote, he says, the earth is not such a mess as it seems to be. I started laughing when I read that. I said, sure, for an ascendant master, maybe not. But for the rest of us, you know, there is always some pain and it doesn't have to deal with the, be about poverty. You know, I mean, we're all in some sort of a mental grip, which is painful enough. Is it really true? The earth is not such a mess, Peter, tell us. Well, you know, it depends on how you look at it. It appears to be a mess, you know, like, uh, you know, my kitchen floor appears to need, has some dirt, I need to sweep it, you know what I mean? So I go out, I'll get busy today with the broom and sweep my floor, you know, but then I think, well, this is God's house, it is God's floor, and I am God sweeping the floor, so I can make it into, and, you know, God is going to send people to me and they would like to see a clean floor so you know I'm doing God's work doing that but you know we were given free will you know it's it, it's interesting because you know a kalpa lasts something like over four billion years you know what I mean so there's what's called the day and the night of God you know each one lasts you know 4.2 billion years something like that so for four billion years, God was in samadhi. Is the yuga and you're then, talking about, right? Like when the Kali Yuga goes into the... Oh, yeah. And the, the yuga. yugas are just small parts of a kalpa, you know? So, you know, it's like God woke up one morning after being in bliss for four billion years and said, well, I'm a little bit bored now. I'm back into... I'm aware of, you know... I'm coming back into duality. What kind of, like, I'd like to watch a good video or something exciting, do you know? You know, so God says, I think I'll create a movie and I'll give these beings, they'll have a spark of me in them, but they'll forget that they're me and they'll get into all kinds of trouble and experiment with things. And then they'll have the joy of coming back and remembering who they are and they can clean up and so on. So, you know, we're sort of actors in God's video game, you know, or God's movie. I don't, I don't like these video games, mostly they're negative, you know, but we, we can realize that we can change the game, you know, that we are not only the characters, we are the creators of the video game, you know, so it's kind of exciting to think, well, you know, the appearance is that it's a mess, but I can not only clean up the mess, but I don't have to identify with the mess. I can look up my true nature, which is Satchitananda. You know, I can turn inward and say, okay, I just read the news. Looks like there may be a war in that part of the world, you know, but I can be in joy here and I can send my joy to those people in that part of the world, you know. And not only that, but there are divine beings around me helping me. You know, I, I, I have contact with Yogananda and uh, also Sri Yukteswar, Babaji, you know, those beings um they're here to help us when you call on them you know to strengthen that light within you you know even like ananda may mai i experience her now as what i call an ascended master you maybe call her a maha siddha or something like that a bodhisattva but she's she's liberated being and she she didn't merge with the absolute and disappear she's in a higher body helping people who need help you know my teacher pearl does not have to come back in a physical body but she is helping me and she's helping you and and many other people you say pearl i i need your help i would like to find you know the god within me the pearl in my own heart you know right. so i don't know if did I answer that question a little bit, maybe? I, I... Yes, you did, you know, I, because uh, the, you know, there's always a part that, you know, like, like understand this is God's leela or play, you know, and it's all consciousness at play, so there's nothing bad or good. But till we are in that, you know, space of the ego mind and there is 
action and reaction, we all tend to get drawn in like the drama of suffering. You know, any kind of pain like, is something we shrug away, run away. It's not easy for most of us to embrace pain. Oh, you yeah, know. No, sure. Nobody <laughs> likes pain. Yeah. Nobody likes it. So, you know, then it gets like, you know, maybe it's not like even a personal pain. Like, you know, sometimes seeing somebody else suffer, it could be anybody. It could be an animal. It could be human, anybody. You see the pain and, you know, it's not like you can help them sometimes physically with the pain. And then you wonder like, you know, why? If we are all consciousness, why? Like just ease them of the suffering. I mean, uh, this is something I often feel personally sometimes. It's not just per se about my pain or anything. It could be like, you know, you just watch it and you see, wow. And sometimes I, you know, personally, I sometimes feel uh, I'm very blessed. I don't have to worry about a lot of things in my life. And I'm like, yet there are so many other beings who are the same consciousness suffering (laughs) or not maybe. Yeah. you know so so when i read that i was like okay this is only yes it can be only a master who can say it but i wonder if uh, all of us can come to that understanding as well yes i mean i can understand why people suffer if you talk about karma you know that in a past life they did what's being done to them and this is you know teaching them some lesson that they need what I don't, what I had a hard time understanding is why animals suffer. Why do they need to suffer? Do you know what I mean? Like where I live here, there are wild rabbits, you know, and then there's uh, hawks and out birds and other like cats that eat the rabbits. Do you know why does that rabbit need to suffer? That rabbit can't have karma. Do you know what I mean? But then I thought, well. The suffering of that rabbit, I witnessed it, and it's teaching me compassion. You know, it's somehow opening my heart to have more compassion for life, you know? That this very, like, rich experience. One of the highest books that you can read is the Bhagavad Gita, because Arjuna is saying, I don't want to cause suffering, you know? especially suffering to people I know, people, maybe relatives and teachers. Do you know what I mean? And Krishna says, no, you have a duty. You have to fight. That I have already determined who is going to live and die and who is going to suffer and so on. And, you know, this is really talking about karma yoga, you know, that uh, that's very high teaching, I think, you know. Each of us is an Arjuna, you know, as we go through life, we have a certain duty that we have to do, do you know what I mean? You know, and, you know, there's a war going on in your intestinal tract, you know, there's beings trying to eat you, (laughs) but your body secretes certain juices that kill them, you know? You know, so does it matter how small the being is that you are killing? You know, whether it's an ant or whether it's a cow or what, you know, you're killing every day millions of creatures in your own body. You know, your immune system is doing that. And that's your duty. It's your duty to be healthy. So to do that, you have to kill microorganisms, you know. Well, that's, you're fighting the battle of Kurukshetra every day in your body. (laughs) Yeah. So yeah, everything, look, everything in perspective, you know, I have, I have friends who are vegan, they won't eat any dairy product or, you know, ghee or any, anything like that. But, you know, when I was about seven years old, I pulled a carrot out of the ground and I heard it scream, Mm. you know, I killed the carrot, you know, and it had life, you know. And I, I make sprouts, you know, I, I, I take seeds and soak them and they sprout, you know, and I eat the sprouts because it's supposed to be very good for you. But I look at them, they're living beings, they want to grow into plants, do you know what I mean? And I'm eating them alive, you know. But, you know, my guidance is to eat them, that they're willing to sacrifice themselves for my health. So I, I give gratitude to them and I pray to the sprouts and I you know, it's not the sprouts themselves, but there's life. They're, they're provided by the Divine Mother, you know, and I give gratitude 
and everything is eating something. Do you know that's mm -hmm. how we live? So again, this teaches us compassion. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, I have a wood desk here. Well, this desk was a tree at some point. Somebody cut the tree down. The tree wanted to live another 20 years. Do you know what I mean? But somebody came and chopped it down, sliced it into boards. Now I have a desk, you know? It, 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 you know, it teaches us compassion for life, you know, and gratitude, you know? Yeah. Basically giving up the idea of doership, right? Where yeah. you, like, life is not like, like, when you give the example of Arjun, it's like, you know, Krishna tells him, like, it's your duty because I've already decided, like, what you said, like, it's going to happen yeah. anyway. It's already yeah. will. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, when I drive into town to the post office and I park the car, I see a hundred dead bugs on my windshield that I, I killed them by driving my car. So what should I walk into town instead? But then I'll be stepping on ants and other bugs. Do you know what I mean? You cannot live without killing something. Yeah. So again, the thing is, you know, if I give gratitude to life, and I know every, these things that are die that, that die are returning to the source. You know, that they're. I pray that anything that I kill will be liberated. You know, and ex experience being one with the source again. You know, so just like someday. I will leave my body and, and something will eat my ashes or something, you know what I mean? It's like, uh, so yeah. I think the key is that, you know, gratitude and it teaches us compassion that all, all beings are suffering to some degree, you know what I mean? Or experience suffering. Right. And uh, that's kind of the nature of duality, you know, you know. But uh, but we can we can share love with each other and compassion and do what we can you know to help each other, and I think that's uh, kind of the key you know. So I have one last question for you, Peter, because I think this oh. is uh, you know oh. something okay. I think uh, which uh, everyone will love. There is. You mentioned something, not to you mentioned, but you know, like one of the uh, ascendant masters, uh, there is a mention of a violet flame and uh, how we are all flame bearers. Could yes. you talk a little bit about that and how like somebody can incorporate it in their daily life? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because mm -hmm. I believe like that, that little meditation that's there, I mean, it burns up your karma and uh, it's about forgiveness. I mean, that's what I got. Yes. Well, actually, when you meditate, if I see a group of people meditating, sometimes I will see this violet light in the room. And the violet, like it's in the rainbow, you know, all these colors. And that's because in the white light, there actually is violet light. You know, there's also green light and blue light and so on. But violet is the most transmuting quality of light. And it has the power to dissolve negative thoughts you know, and negative energy, people who want healing can invoke the violet light in their body. Like I, I healed, I had a toothache and I invoked violet light and it dissolved it. It took, it took about an hour of focus on that, but it worked, you know, and um, I've experienced, I can just imagine this being made of violet light, like a goddess above someone. I call that violet Tara. Mm. It's sending violet light down into them. And that's very purifying quality of light. So, so you can in, invoke it around yourself too, it, it, to burn up any negative thought pattern. Or let's say you live in a neighborhood and there's some negative energy. Say, I, I am the violet consuming flame blazing through my neighborhood, dissolving and consuming everything less than perfection, you know? And it's very Gee. purifying. Just, just like, you know, in the, a, uh, a violet light. Yeah, violet uh -huh. light, like a violet rainbow light, you know, or a neon, neon tube. Imagine there's a neon tube around you. You're inside of this and you 
you throw a switch and suddenly that violet light is going up through you. See, that cleans your spiritual body just like you would take a shower or a bath to clean your physical body. The violet light or violet fire purifies your emotional and spirit and, you know, etheric body. That's beautiful. Uh, Peter, would you like to just send a little blessing across to everybody who is listening? Because I think we yes. can all do with some blessing. I'm doing that. So I am invoking the presence of God to come forth for all your listeners in whatever form they can receive it to enlighten every one of them and to heal them and bring everyone happiness and abundance and raise them into the consciousness, activity and dominion of their own God presence, which I am. So each, each of your listeners can say, not from the ego, but from the God center in their heart, I am the presence of the living God. And let that go out and then let go of it. And they can say that any time during the day, I am God in action in this situation. And then let go of it. Otherwise, you get the ego attached to it, just to let go that it's God that's saying that. It's not you saying it. It's God within you saying that. So anyway, so I say, namaste. The God in me honors the God in you and the God in all your listeners. And yeah, to everybody who's listening, I have uh, just had the chance to read one book, but the books are amazing. So whichever one, because I felt that book was calling to me, which is why I picked it. So I'm sure the books will also call to each reader as and when they need it. So you really must check it out. Also, is there like a website, a uh, specific yeah, website? It's called iamteachings.com. So I A M uh, teachings, T E A C H I N G S dot com. You know. Yeah, I'm going to have that in my description uh, for anybody who would like to reach out and, you know, uh, for the books or any other teaching that they would like to, you know, access or maybe even mail to you, Peter. Thank you so much. It's very funny because these teachings originated in India ages ago. Now I give them in English, you know, then they come back to India in a different form, you know. I think it's um, the way everybody needs it at which point, right? It just Yes, exactly. Teachings are the same. Masters are the same. Sometimes you just need it in a different way. It's, exactly. Uh, that's all. And thank you, Nandita. You're doing wonderful work. And I know the masters are aware of you and are helping you. <laughs>